autographs and Girl Scout cookies. I mean, I, I'm in the market. I really appreciate it. Everybody's doing okay? Say, I'm okay. Does anybody have five pages of notes already? Okay, I'm sure you're filling up your book. I appreciate that. Okay, we've got a couple of more subjects now to get through, and we've got just about 55 minutes to do it. So let's get started. First, let's talk about my, my version of financial independence. You've heard from Brian. You've heard, you know, some excellent advice. Dennis, you know, these guys are long time experienced, and I'm sure you've got good notes on their presentation. Uh, this little bit I, you know, designed a long, long time ago. It's still valid today. Here's one of the major goals to go for, financial independence. Every American's, you know, right, privilege to become financially independent. So here's my definition of financial independence. The ability to live, and I'll give you time to write it down. The ability to live from the income of your personally invested resources. The ability to live from the income of your personally invested resources. That's the simple definition. That from the resources you've invested, the income from those resources, you could live. Here's one of the advantages of financial independence. Now you can work or not work. Or you can certainly choose the work to do. Now you can work by choice, not by necessity. And here's one of the best, to be able to work for joy and not for necessity. At first, of course, we have to work for necessity. But if you can finally reach the point where you can work for joy, not for necessity, that happened for me all those years ago. My father kept talking about financial independence, debt free, no one having a claim on your assets, finally being able to live from the income of your invested resources. I remember the joyful day when that finally arrived. So what I've done now, most of my life, I've had the unique privilege of working for joy, not for necessity. Not that the joy doesn't bring you more income. Not that working for joy doesn't make you another fortune. It certainly has for me, right? Another fortune and another fortune and another fortune. But it, not because I had to, but because I wanted to. I work now for joy and not for necessity. Key phrase to understand, we should teach this to our children, economics is major. Everyone has to major in economics. Number one, for personal survival. To produce enough to take care of yourself. The first, economics. The next good phrase on economics, it's not what you earn, it's what you do with what you earn that makes the great difference in your financial future. All of this is determined by your own philosophy. It's important early, and kids have to have a personal philosophy working even when they go to school. Here's a good definition of your personal philosophy, a guidance system. Your personal philosophy is a guidance system. And it does simply two things. Helps you to see the opportunities, take advantage of those. Helps you to see the dangers, minimize those. And as we learn and grow, we learn hopefully early to spot the dangers so they don't overcome us. We hopefully we learn early to see the opportunities and take advantage of those, maximize them if we can. That guidance system is like a sail on a 
sailboat. The winds are always blowing, favorable winds, unfavorable winds, stormy winds, economic winds, political winds. The wind is always blowing. But to arrive at a predetermined destination, it is not just the blowing of the wind that we have to deal with. Here's the major part, the set of the sail. The set of the sail is what you learn, gathering information from these three days. Talking to each other, gathering more information, filling up one journal, then another one. Information. Guidance on how to trim the sail, set the sail. The Sunday morning sermon, the lyrics of a song, the dialogue of the movie. Words put into good structure so that they deliver enlightenment, information, knowledge. And we use that to set sail. And it isn't that you set sail once and then that's it and it's over. It is a continual setting of sail every day, every month, every year. Setting sail economically, trimming the sail. For your good health, you just have to set sail toward the destination you wish to reach, having good health. Then it's easy to neglect, then it's easy to slide. Here's one of the better phrases. Everything by longevity tends to get off course. Everything by longevity tends to get off course. When the early astronauts made those trips to the moon, on the way to the moon, here's what they had to engage in, mid-course corrections. They look at all the gauges and some solar winds that they didn't expect has pushed them off course as they look at the gauges. Now they must fire the little rockets to get the ship, the spaceship back on course. And it's especially critical if you're headed for the moon. <laughs> if you're in an airplane and you miss Los Angeles and, you know, make San Francisco, you're okay. But you can't miss the moon. <laughs> and here's why. If you miss the moon, you can't get back. So just put this little note now. It's a pretty serious note. Some destinations are critical. Speaking of going to the moon, we just celebrated that, right? Neil Armstrong and the others. I met Neil Armstrong one time, a little talk he gave. Neil Armstrong, here's what he said in his little talk. Going to the moon was just a matter of solving a couple of problems. I thought, that's a simple way to put it. <laughs> Problem number one, how to get there. <laughs> and then you just figure that out, how to get there. Problem number two, what? How to get back. That's problem number two, and you just solve that. Now, he said, it's also critical not to leave until you've solved both problems. <laughs> I thought that was classic. Wow, speeches and information give us so much to chew on, right? Because you know what I did in some of my enterprises? I figured out how to get, how to get in. I, I didn't figure out how to get out. And some cost me more than I wanted to pay. Just because I, you know, too quickly figured how to get in, did not figure how to get out. Whether it's a lecture like we've engaged in here, hours and hours and hours, or whether it's a simple sermon, one of the most classic sermons I ever heard originated not far from here in the Crystal Cathedral. I used to do little speeches for the positive thinkers' breakfast meetings. at the Crystal Cathedral, before it was the Crystal Cathedral. Little sessions they had in the morning, right, where you could attend and hear some speakers. I used to do some of those speeches, I don't know, 35 years ago, a long time ago. 
possibility thinkers breakfast as there was. His son, uh, Schubert Jr., was giving a classic sermon one morning and I was privileged to hear it. Here was the notes on his sermon. It's very brief so I'll give it to you. So jot this down. These are great notes. Here was his sermon. Number one, if you think it's impossible, it isn't. That's number one. If you think it's impossible, it isn't. Here was point number two. If you think you know everything, you don't. Wow, that's good. Point number three. If you think you're alone, you're not. Isn't that a classic? That's a classic sermon. If you think it's impossible, it isn't. If you think you know everything, you don't. And if you think you're, you're alone, you're not. Now here was one of the spectacular stories in this little sermon. He told the story of Rich DeVos, who started the big uh, Amway Corporation. Rich DeVos is in bad shape. Rich needs a heart transplant. And if he doesn't get it, he's not going to last very long. Now, fast forward. Rich DeVos finally gets his heart transplant. And what was spectacular about the story was, after his heart transplant, he has dinner with the lady who gave him her heart. <laughs> he has dinner with the lady who gave him her heart. You say what? That's impossible. You couldn't have dinner with the person that gave you their heart. Here's what happened. This lady was desperately ill and needed a lung transplant. A donor was found. And sometimes it's much better in a lung transplant if the heart and the lung go together. So this lady gets the heart and the lung transplant that she needs to save her life. Now her heart is left over from this operation and her heart goes to Rich DeVos. That's how Rich was able to have dinner with the lady who gave him her heart. Isn't that a fantastic story? I love those simple little stories. One, two, three. A couple of illustrations. Wow. Just dramatic, dynamic. Anyway, where was I before I got off on these uh, stories? Here? Your philosophy. Whether it's your philosophy about economics or your philosophy about marriage or your guidance system about good health. It's easy to get off track. So by longevity, we start and sure enough, it drifts off course. And that's what sermons are for. And that's what the lyrics of the songs are for in personal conversation is to get us what? Back on track. Back on track. And hopefully we're not too far off track so that it doesn't take too long to get back on track. So maybe that's all you needed this weekend. You're doing pretty good, but in a few things you've drifted a little to the right or you've drifted a little to the left or, or just by, you know, a casual approach to some things instead of the serious approach, you know, you're a little bit off track. And it doesn't take that long if it hasn't gone on too long to get back on track, back on track. But even if it's been a long time, you can start the process overnight. You can start the process decision making this weekend could be some of the most important of your life and your future. Not because we have given the seminars, but because the moment was right for you. And somehow it was said okay, and somehow it was delivered with sincerity. And you got the message, and this weekend makes a pivotal turn for you in terms of the set of the sail. Okay, your philosophy. Now, your philosophy about money. Someone mentioned the other day, the love of money. 
What about money? What about success? It's a good debate. I've got a good question, and it's a bit, it's not necessarily a high moral question, but it's a pretty good question. If you could do better, should you? That's not a bad question. Now, all of us have personal choice, but this is a good question, and a lot of my stuff is up for debate. You know, I don't even claim to be right. If you take all these notes and throw them away and go listen to somebody else, I'll be just as happy. Because, you know, it doesn't matter. As long as you finally, right, get the ideas that make a difference for you and add to the wealth and the structure of your own life systems, that's what's important. Not that I deliver the message that's all important. But piece by piece, and speaker by speaker, and teacher by teacher, and phrase by phrase, and book by book, we pick up the information that helps us to fine-tune our life and our future. But this is a good one for your own debate. If you could do better, should you? That's a good one. Now, let's talk about financial independence. When I meet Mr. Shoff, I'm not in good shape. Here's where I was when I met him. Pennies in my pocket, and nothing in the bank. Because the story of the Girl Scout with the cookies had just occurred in my life. And now I meet this man. Here's what he said. Now to get started in a whole new direction, here's what you need to do. You need to develop a financial statement. So just make a little note on your notes there. If you haven't ever done it, this is not a bad place to start. A financial statement. And a financial statement is very simple. It's a piece of paper with a line down the middle. On this side is the value of all your assets. And over here is all of your liabilities. Here's what you've got in terms of worth. And here's what you owe. And then when you add up all of the value of your assets and you add up all that you owe called liabilities, we come up with what we call now finally when you subtract one from the other your current net worth. Now this is not your net worth as a father, this is not your net worth as a parent, this is not your net worth as a friend. There's all kinds of worth and value. But if you really want your economics to go better, here's a good place to start. Key phrase, take a picture of where you are. And here's what it's called, the truth. Now, you don't have to publish this in some local newspaper, right? This is all private stuff. But there's, you, you have to say, you know, finally, there's no use kidding myself. I got to take a picture of where I am. I got to know how good it is or I got to know what? I got to know how bad it is. I got to know how much I'm on the upside or how deep a hole am I really in. So this is what I started. It was a simple little program of coming up with my current net worth. My liabilities, that was easy. I owed my parents, I owed, I owed, I owed. I made the third uh, borrowing on my car and he was threatening to come and get it, drag it down the road, rear end up in front of my neighbors. So I had plenty of liabilities. On the asset side, I am really, I put my furniture even. I, I put everything I could think of. My shoes, I mean, wouldn't the Salvation Army give me two dollars for my shoes? I mean, I am scrambling. And when I did this exercise, guess what it did? It really soberly gave me a current picture of where I was. And guess what? I was unhappy. But here's what's important about the truth. It sets you free. Number one, free to correct old errors in judgment. That's what the truth is for. To correct old errors. After six years, I started working when I was 19. And when I took a picture of where I was, it was not a very happy experience. So now, where do we go from here? In putting together a financial statement, realizing exactly where we are, no nonsense, this is the real deal. We don't have to share it with anybody, but we do need to know the truth for ourselves. Now here's what we need. Number one, perhaps a new philosophy. Let me give you sort of the simple philosophy of the rich and the poor. 
Here's the philosophy usually of the rich and the poor. Poor people spend their money and invest what's left. <coughs> Brian talked a little bit about that and there's usually what? Not much left. Here's usually the philosophy of the rich. The rich invest their money and spend what's left. It's just a little turn of semantics. But the little turn of semantics is like the turn of the set of the sail that takes you in a whole different direction to uh, wind up at a good place in one year or a place, you know, of average, mundane, where you don't really want to be. Just that little simple shift of philosophy. So here's the key. Think like the rich. Invest your money first, then spend what's left. Don't spend your money and invest what's left. Now the whole key is lifestyle, and, and Brian touched a little bit on that. When I gave this little class one time at a school class, the teacher said, you know, you must not you know, promise people that with a little bit of investment every month that they can, you know, make their fortune because people nowadays are overloaded, they're spending everything they make, you know, their standard of living is right up there. And I said, well, that's, this is where it all begins. I said, could we think of someone, and this was a long time ago, of course, that makes $2,000 a month? She said, yes, no problem. We can probably find someone that makes $2,000 a month. What would this couple, this family tell you it takes to pay all the bills and just keep their head above water? And she said, well, 2000 I said, could we possibly find somebody not far from here that makes $2,500 a month? Right, maybe even both working combined. $2,500 a month, $500 a month more. What would this family say it probably takes to pay all the bills and keep your head above water? What would they say? Right? 2500 So I said to her, what happened to this $500? How did it disappear? Wisely invested over some reasonable period of time, the return is unbelievable. And she said, I never thought about that. So jot this down. The money is always there either to spend or invest. The difference in what you do with it is based on philosophy, not economy. It isn't the state of America's economy that makes the difference. It's the difference in your philosophy. Right, that illustration? Here's a book on how to get rich. It costs $20. Somebody says, well, a poor person can't buy that book. Say, no, it's only seven Coca-Colas. And you either spend the money on the seven Coca-Colas or a $20 book that teaches you how to get rich. So jot this down. Everybody has the money. Even the poorest of the poor. The key is how to spend it. The key is what to spend it for. And how you spend it. First, how you earn it is determined by your philosophy. Second, now, how you spend it is determined also by your personal philosophy. So what would be a good philosophy to follow? And this is the little simple form I want to give you on financial independence, wealth for the future. It won't take long now to jot this down. It takes a little longer to go do it, but here it is. What to do with a dollar. If a child asks what to do with a dollar, here's my suggestion. Never spend more than 70 cents. 70 cents. You've got to pick some number, right? This is the number I've picked, right? Listen to Brian, listen to Dennis, listen to me, and then refine your own to suit you. But I suggest don't spend more than 70 cents. Here's where the other 30 cents goes. 10 cents, 10% 10 of your income for charity church, whatever, supporting worthy projects, teaching children here to become generous. If kids understand generosity, they'll give you 10 cents out of every dollar that they earn. And this is a good place to start. It's easy to give 10 cents out of a dollar. A little more difficult to give 100,000 out of a million. You say, oh, if I had a million dollars, I'd give a hundred thousand. I'm not that sure. <laughs> we, 
we better start you early, right? So that when the big money comes, it'll just be automatic. You won't even have to think about it. Okay. All right. So 10 cents for charity and church. Here's the next 10 cents. Active capital. Try to make a profit. It's called buy and sell. I learned to do this starting at age 25. It's how I made my first fortune. Buying and selling. Like the little boy who buys a bottle of soap for $2 and sells it for 3 Active capital means you try to make the profit. Buy a piece of property and improve it and sell it. Active capital. Keep saving up this active capital until you've got some to work with to buy and sell. Make a profit. Now the third 10 cents is passive capital. Which means let somebody else use this 10%. You put this to work and see if you can't make a profit. This is to let someone else use it. You are the passive partner in providing the money. They are the active partner in seeing if they can make a profit and pay you dividends and stock increase and, and uh, whatever. Interest. And that little formula is a good place to start. Now you might not really be able to start there. I call this the ideal. Maybe by the time you've heard this, you're in such bad financial shape that you have to go here, 97, 1, 1, and 1. That right now you're in a trap. You're caught. And it's going to take you a while to get out. So right now you've got to spend 97 percent of your income right for your living and lifestyle because you know you're caught you're obligated you know there's no way out and then the rest of these now are just one one and one the key is to start with something now mr shof gave me a comment it has served me all these years here's the comment it's not the amount that counts it's the plan that counts When I first met him, I said, if I had more money, I'd have a better plan. He said, no, if you had a better plan, you'd have more money. So if you have to, you start with 97, 1, 1, and 1. Then what do you do? Now comes the project right away of trying to get this 97 figure to go down and these other three numbers to start going up. This now becomes an exciting game to play. In another seminar, I talk about measuring progress. This is, this is one of the great motivating factors in the world, is to start something and make progress. Start something and make progress. So Jim Rohn told us the ideal was 70, 10, 10, and 10. But I can't start there. I've got to start with 97, 1, 1, and 1. And here's what you've got to understand. This is okay. I mean, if this is where you have to start, that's where you have to start. Then you start driving this number down and start driving these numbers up. And it's a whole game to play till finally you can arrive at this pretty good ideal way what to do with the money you earn from a paycheck or from dividends or from whatever sources. 70, 10, 10, 10. I mentioned the name Sarah Alfaro in Mexico. I taught her this and she's been teaching it to the people uh, she's responsible for over all the last 10 years and some of them now are doing extremely well making big money and they've got houses and cars and you know all kinds of stuff 70 10 10 and 10 now when you start getting into the big money these numbers have to change again I probably don't spend more than 10 percent of my income so if I if this number for me is 10 percent you can imagine what these other three numbers probably are. So if you have to, you start here. Get to the ideal. And then when it really starts to flow in your favor, you rearrange this program again 10%. Because if you're doing big time, you know, you couldn't spend 70% of your income, it would be obscene. <laughs> So, just a little formula to follow. Now here's the wrap up, and I've got to get to a few points on leadership before we finish. Here's the next one now. 
This is only a suggested plan. You know, this is not written in any law. You know, most advantages and benefits for the future are not written in law. There's no law that says you must not have a heart attack. Where is it written? There is no law. That you must demand of yourself. There is no demand that you have a good financial plan that will safely take care of your family for the future. There is no law. You can be careless and lose it all and finally have to be supported by the state. So there is no law that you must be responsible and have a good financial plan. You must demand it of yourself. So I'm asking you to make that note. It's what we demand of ourselves that counts. There's no law that says you must have a health plan that's going to make you extremely healthy for the next 10 years. There is no law. That you must demand of yourself. And those are the disciplines now that really start to count. The ones you demand of yourself. So, next. Keep strict accounts. Keep strict accounts. Have you ever heard this expression? I don't know where it all goes. Did you ever hear that? Oh, we'd love to have you run our company. You don't know where it all goes. Did you ever hear this? It just gets away from me. Oh, we'd love to have you run the world. It just gets away from you? Okay. Will you make the note now? Keep strict accounts. This is for your own self-esteem, as well as safety and financial matters for the future. Keep strict accounts. You've got to do it, you know, for the IRS. You've got to do it for the tax uh, bill that comes due. Then there's one more. Be happy to pay your taxes. And this is an assignment that's one of the toughest. I'm trying to finish this book I've been working on for so long. Hopefully I'll get it done one of these days. And the title is, Of Course Kids Should Pay Taxes. And it's a little book on really everybody should pay taxes. And then you need to know why. In California, if a 10-year-old walks into 7-Eleven and buys something that costs a dollar, the proprietor asks the child for eight more pennies. Does the child have a right to know how come we're asking him for eight more pennies? And the answer is yes. The kid says, I'm only 10 years old. And the proprietor says, congratulations, you're my youngest taxpayer. <laughs> now the kid wants to know, who gets these eight pennies? Where does it go? And here's what the proprietor, if he's wise, says, well, if you want to ride your bicycle on the sidewalk instead of in the mud, you have to pay the eight pennies. Everybody pays the eight pennies on every dollar so that we have streets and we have a sidewalk. So you don't have to ride your bicycle in the dirt and the mud, you got the sidewalk. And now the child understands, okay, here's my eight pennies. So jot this down now, everybody has to pay. We can't let anybody off the hook because all of us are in this together. And you can't build your own section of the street out in front of your home. What kind of equipment would you need to build your own piece of the street out in front of your house? No, you can't do that. So we take these collective needs that all of us need and we ante up the money, whether it's federal or state or sales tax or whatever it is, so that all of this is taken care of us. Here's what it's called, the care and feeding of the goose that lays the golden eggs. You say, well, the goose eats too much. That's probably true. <laughs> but make this note, better a fat goose than no goose at all. So everybody has to pay. How much do you think aircraft carriers cost? We can't use used missiles. <laughs> Here's where else the money goes. So you'll be safe in your bed at night while the policeman walks the beat. While we sleep, the Air Force doesn't sleep. While we sleep, the Army doesn't sleep. 
While we sleep, the policeman walks the beat and checks the doors. That's where the money goes. Once you have a vision of where the money goes, yes, for some things it costs too much. Yes, the government sometimes is too extravagant. Yes, yes, all the yeses. But all those yeses are true for all of us. Sure, the goose might eat too much, but who doesn't? <laughs> Should we have confession time here today? <laughs> Say, no, no, no. Please let me off the hook. So you got to do the same with the government. Yes, the government needs to go on a diet and slim down and not spend quite so much. That's also true. But it's true of what? All of us. This is the deal. We're in all of this thing together. So finally, when I understood what this was all about, I finally became a very strange creature called a happy taxpayer. <laughs> That's it. Now, should everybody pay? Let me give you one good illustration that comes from the Bible and I'm finished. Jesus one day, and I'm an amateur on the Bible, but here's a classic story. The storyteller says, Jesus one day was out in front of the synagogue watching people come in. And with him were his disciples. So Jesus and his disciples are watching people come in to the synagogue. And the custom was, before they came into the synagogue, they deposited a contribution. They deposited the contribution, went on into the church. The story says some came with large contributions and went in. Some came with small contributions and went in. And as the disciples and Jesus watched, a little lady came along and she put two pennies in the treasury and walked in. And Jesus said, look at that. And his disciples said, two pennies, two pennies, what's two pennies? He said, no, you don't understand. She gave more than everybody else. They said, two pennies is more than everybody else? He said, yes. Because I'm sure that two pennies represented almost all of what she had. So since her two pennies represented almost all of what she had, she gave the most. What a classic philosophy. Now here's what did not occur. I'm so brilliant, I can give you what the storyteller left out. <laughs> here's what did not occur in this little scene. When the little lady put her two pennies in the treasury, uh, Jesus and his disciples did not run after her and say, hey, hold it, hold it, little lady. Uh, hold it, little lady. Uh, we've observed what's happened with putting the two pennies in the treasury, and we've decided that uh, you're so pitiful and you're so poor that we've decided to give you back your two pennies. I'm here to tell you that did not occur. So make this note from this little story. Jesus left her two pennies in the treasury, even though it was most of what she had. Wow. That's such a classic lesson in philosophy. That's such a classic lesson in what all of us are involved in, in making contributions. Shouldn't everybody wish to pay? The government has decided to leave some people that they consider poor and pitiful off the tax rolls. See, that's unthinkable. Shouldn't they, even if they only paid a dollar, so that they can be able to say what? I pay. I make my contribution. No matter how poor I am, if all I've got is pennies, I give some as contribution whether it's taxes or whether it's benevolence or whatever it is. Okay, isn't that a great story? It's a good story. Okay, now to finish up, in the next 20 minutes, let's talk about leadership. Wish we had a week. I've got all this stuff here. Anyway, perhaps we'll do this again. Leadership. I got a good phrase for you now on leadership to start with. Here it is. To attract attractive people, you must be attractive. 
We keep, we keep coming back to the same central theme. Personal development is the key to the better future. Success is something you attract. And to attract attractive people, you must be attractive. To attract dedicated people, what? You must be dedicated. To attract positive people, you must be positive. To attract loyal people, you must be loyal. To attract gifted people, you must be gifted. To attract sincere people, you must be sincere. It's a matter of attracting the people you want. That's really the key to leadership. Next, leadership is the big challenge of the 80s. Science, politics, industry, education, sales. <clears throat> Here's one of the most important leadership roles in the future, parenting. Parenting, mother and father. Or sometimes a single father or a single mother that has to be both mother and father. This is such an incredible challenge. Guess who the great heroes are in our country? Teachers and single mothers. I can't imagine the job. It's almost too tough to imagine. I was coming back once from San Diego, back to Los Angeles, and it was one o'clock. I'd been to a very late meeting. I stopped by Denny's. 24-hour coffee shop was open. I stopped by Denny's. It's one o'clock in the morning, and I walk in to have a little something, a piece of pie, I think it was, and a cup of coffee. And at Denny's at one o'clock in the morning was the Avon lady. <laughs> and she had a couple of waitresses around her, and she was showing the Avon products. One o'clock in the morning. When I finished my pie and coffee, I engaged her in conversation. I said, I have never seen an Avon lady at Denny's at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> she says, well, this is the best time. When the waitresses aren't so busy, and one at a time or two at a time, they can come and sit at my table, look at what I've got and make purchases. I says, why do you do this? And she said, I'm a single mother with two children. Don't have to say any more, right? One o'clock in the morning at Denny's. This is called commitment of the best kind, right? Wow, these are the heroes. People that have such extraordinary circumstances to have to deal with, and they do it. They have such responsibility and they do it. Right? They're stacked high with, you know, difficulties and they, they do it. They do it. Especially mothers. So the challenge is parenting, leadership in parenting. Here's the next challenge in leadership. To step above mediocrity. Where you can not only help yourself, but help someone else. Now, here's the refinement of leadership skills. This is a good list to make. Be strong but not rude. Be kind but not weak. Strength we need, rudeness we don't need. Kindness we need, but not weakness. Some people mistake weakness for kindness. But don't do that for yourself. Next is to be bold but not a bully. Refinement of leadership skills. Next is to be humble but not timid. Humility we need. Timidity you must overcome. Drive it into a small corner. Don't let it dominate your life. Whatever you have to do. Next is to be thoughtful but not lazy. Here's a good one. To be proud but not arrogant. Pride we need, arrogance we don't need. Family pride, personal pride, community pride, school pride, team pride. We do need pride but not arrogance. Next is humor without folly. This is part of sophistication everybody needs to work for. 
humor without folly, witty but not silly, These combinations are sometimes really difficult to pull off. Here's what the old prophet said. This is a good one for your notes. Be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. How to be both wise and harmless. See, that is, that takes some real doing. Most wise people are not that harmless and most harmless people are not that wise. But the real challenge is to be both wise and harmless. One of the writer New Testament said, I've learned to be both ambitious and content. Now that is a real stretch. But here was his solution. To be content with what you've achieved and ambitious for more. Right? To engage in contentment with what you... If you're always discontented with what you've achieved or what you have, see that, that is the wrong malady. But if you're happy with what you've achieved, but ambitious for more, that's the key. Most ambitious people are not that content, and most content people are not that ambitious. But he said, here's what to strive for, to be both ambitious and content, to be both wise and harmless. Next, in leadership. Here's the major studies for leadership as you continue your journey. Number one, the study of possibilities. Play the what-if game. What if I had the resources to make the investment so my family would be secure and I had reached financial independence? What if? If you engage in the what-if game for the future, what if I took these extra classes? What if I developed these extra skills? What if I really disciplined myself to do more than I've ever done before? What could possibly be the outcome? Engage in that what-if game. What if I found the right people over the next six months? What could I possibly accomplish that I haven't accomplished so far? This is good, the what-if game. When I found an unusual financial opportunity, the first night I played the what-if game. By three in the morning, I'd made about three million dollars. <laughs> on paper. On paper. But jot this down, that's where it starts. What if I had two? What if I had five? What if I had five and they each had five and we all worked together for this common cause? What could we accomplish? Wow, just play the what if game. And then that saves you from later having to play this game. If I'd have only, if I'd have only kept that piece of property instead of selling it. Years and years ago, I owned 10 acres in Carefree, Arizona. I bought it for $50,000 and I sold it for $80,000. I made $30,000. Here's what was tragic. I didn't need to sell it. It is now worth probably over a million dollars. So now I say, if I'd have, what? If I'd have only. But we need some of those experiences, right? To help give us a little better guidance for the future. So play the what if game, right? What if it went well? What if I found the right people? What if I had the health and the ability to do extraordinary things? I wonder what all I could do. Play that game. The study of possibility. Here's the next one. The study of opportunity. And you must learn to study opportunity because it, it comes in subtle forms. I got interested in building organization and recruiting people because I found out people could make you rich and wealthy. Here's one of the greatest economic mistakes anyone can make, especially living in America, not understanding that people can make you rich. When I found the opportunity to do that, it helped me make my first fortune recognizing opportunity so that it doesn't come and go. The moment was there and you didn't seize the moment. Begin to recognize more opportunity. The opportunity for association. All of my projects have been association. Two, three people. Right? The old phrase says that two or three agree, nothing's impossible. Just not two or three hundred, not two or three thousand, just two or three. 
with a common purpose, you can do the most extraordinary things. Recognize those opportunities. Here's the next, be a student of ability. If you added one more skill and then one more skill. I started learning extra skills when I was 25 years old, when I met my mentor. One skill led to the next, and one skill led to the next. Finally, my income reached unbelievable proportions, having learned these skills. By the time I was 28, nah, 29 years old, my income had hit about 30,000 a month, which back in those days was so much money. It was unbelievable. I learned those extra abilities, those extra skills. I had no idea when I started how it would compound my income and change my whole financial life and financial future. So have you got that now? Be a student of ability. What if you took on one more skill and then took on one more skill? Next, be a student of inevitability, which is called consequences that you don't want to suffer. If you have a poor diet, it doesn't take that long for the early signs to appear. And if you keep it up, it doesn't take long for the serious signs to appear. The consequences are too deadly. We must be students of inevitability. Yes, inevitability on the positive side, but most of us, you know, can do that. But we must also study inevitability on the negative side. Consequences. If you're in a little boat on the River Niagara, on a little boat with no motor and no oars, and you're 100 feet from the falls, it's called inevitable. It's, it's, it's over. Somebody should have painted you that scene way upstream so that you wouldn't find yourself in such an inevitable position. Right. It's over before you reach the falls in a little boat with no motor and no oars a hundred feet away. Now here's the next one. Be a student of rationality. Be able to put everything through your own mind and your own thinking process. Challenge yourself to think constructively. Here's the next one. Challenge yourself to do some new thinking. I think it was Einstein who said, you know, the real challenge is to, how can we use the same thinking that caused the problems now to come up with the answers? So here's what we have to do, shift gears into some new areas of thinking, new ways of thinking how to solve problems. Not the old thinking that caused the problems, the new style of thinking that creates the answers. Rationality also means Yes, be optimistic, but also be a realist. Here's how it really is. Here's how it could be. Here are the possibilities, but here's how it really is. Take input, but not orders. Abraham Lincoln said, since I would be no one's slave, I will be no one's master. Be no one's slave. Take input, yes. Take advice, yes. Gather in information, yes. And then you decide. Now make this little list. This is a good list. Five sources of inspiration. Number one, deciding. Maybe some of you this weekend have engaged in the decision-making process that is going to send you home with a new phase of inspiration in your life to start making whatever changes you need to make, amend the errors in, in disciplines and judgments. Deciding is so exciting once you've decided, especially those major decisions that you know are going to have an outcome in spite of anything that can happen. Especially if you decide it like this, no matter what. See, that is, you can't believe how 
self-confidence and self-esteem starts to serve you well when you start to say no matter what. Here's the next source of inspiration. Planning what you've decided. Just start laying it out. Here's my new health plan. I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and this. Here's the new financial plan. I'm going to do this, this, and this, and this. My relationship is in a bit of disrepair. I've decided to do this, 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 and this. Just decide and lay out some plans because decision starts the inspiration process and planning furthers the inspiration. Here's the next source of inspiration, beginning the plan, getting started. I taught this a long time ago, I haven't for a long time. An apple a day could start the process of changing your life. Number one, deciding that it's a good thing to do. Number one, before the day is over, to eat the first apple. And especially by the time you've reached the second and the third day, you, here's what you can say, I'm on a new track. And it's only three apples. <laughs> I'm never going back to the old ways, munch, munch, munch. Third day, you could be inspired starting the third day by deciding, first apple, second day, apple, and you can say, hey, I've got, I've got this down. This is going to do it for me. And it can be just that simple. Life-changing decisions, making plans, getting started, following through. Doesn't have to be something profound. You don't have to build a city to get inspired or to prove to somebody, or especially to prove to yourself, that you're on a better track. You're, you're now walking a better path, and the outcome is going to be dramatic and powerful. Key. So then that's the next one. The first source is deciding, the next one is planning, the next one is beginning, here's the next one. Progressing, staying at it. By the time you've finished that first week on a new plan, you'll be so excited. By the time you've finished the first 30 days, on a new financial plan. Regardless how little the progress, the inspiration will continue to grow. Your self-esteem will soar. Then of course here's the fifth source of inspiration and that's finally achieving. Not achieving everything. We cannot do that. We can't achieve everything at once. But we can work on this project and achieve that. Work on the next project and achieve that. We set up this goal and we achieve that. We set up a production goal and we hit it. We set up a goal to increase our income. Within 90 days we had arrived at that new figure. Achieving. Wow. Now in your development as a leader, make these good notes. Learn the law of faith. The law of faith is very simple. Here's what it says. With faith, everything is possible. Without faith, nothing is possible. Faith is the, the ability to see what doesn't yet exist. Faith is the ability to believe that it's possible. Faith is not like tangible. But it is so close to real, we call it a piece of the real. One writer called it evidence. One writer called it substance of something hoped for. Faith. Imagination mixed with faith. Now, as a leader, no telling what you can accomplish. As a father, no telling what you can build. When I built my first house for my family in Idaho all those years ago, I used to take friends of mine out to the vacant lot and show them through the house. <laughs> Is that possible? Sure. Yes, of course. I used to say, here's the three-car garage. And they would look and say, yeah, this will hold three cars. The house that wasn't there, I described it so well they could see it. I could see it. Isn't that what the artist does that puts together the artist's rendering and says, this is the house that isn't there. Say, no, the house isn't there. Say, no, yes, this is the house. So I'd take, you know, my friends on a little journey through the house. This is the fireplace. It's got bricks on one side and it's got white stone on the other side. They would say, wow, what a fireplace. 
and I'd take them through the bedrooms, all, the whole thing. Here's this kitchen with a view window. In the kitchen where you can see this incredible view. And they would look out the window. <laughs> I described that house so well. One day, one of my friends bumped his elbow on the fireplace. <laughs> I'm telling you. <clears throat> Here's what you must do as a leader, especially as a parent. You must be able to see the future. You must be able to design it. Yes, see it as it is. But here's the next step of faith. See it better than it is. If you see it better than it is now, that's the vision. That takes faith. Then here's the third step. We've talked about it so often during these two days already. See it better than it is. Believe it can be better than it is. And number three is make it better. Go to work. And then a little bit of caution. Don't see it for more than it can become. Plenty is possible without being foolish. What did Brian say? So I want to be a millionaire by the end of the week. So would you give us a little longer? <laughs> Come on, that's not realistic. There's a thin line between faith and folly. And that's a good one not to cross. Plenty is possible without being foolish. Here's the next in finishing my portion today. I did a little talk one time on what made me wealthy. And here's what I covered. We did a little bit of it on lifestyle. One was my heritage has made me wealthy. My parents, my children, my, my parents, my books, books I didn't write that I read. What makes me rich is my country that has so much to offer. If I don't take advantage of it, it's my fault. I get to settle some accounts in courts I didn't construct. Send my children to school I studied, schools I didn't build. All part of my heritage. I jump on an airplane I didn't construct. Talk on a telephone I didn't invent. You could just go on and on with this list. The things we've been blessed with that were not the work of our hands, but were the work of many hands and geniuses that put it all together. That whole heritage list is so extraordinary. If you take the time to do it, you'll become so inspired by what you've got and what serves you so well that you didn't put together, somebody else did. Somebody else paid the ultimate price. For our freedom in America, many paid the ultimate price, World War II especially. 50 million people lost their lives in World War II fighting for freedom, trying to stop the Hitler Nazi machine and then communism. Wow, and here we are. It's all handed to us, and the lights are on, and the place is ready, and the seats are here, and the tables are here, and the speaker has arrived. Wow, what gifts we have. Next, I said I'm wealthy because of my experiences. The places I've gone, and the people I've met, and what I've experienced has made me rich. We sometimes hear this expression, he has a wealth of experience. See, that's true. A wealth of experience. So here's the next key on this now. Treat your experiences as wealth, commodity, coin, currency. So what do we do with wealth? We invest it. We invest the wealth of our experiences into the possibilities of the future. Next, I'm wealthy because of my friends and my associates. Extraordinary people who say to me, what do you want to do? We'll just go do it. What do you want to accomplish? We'll just go do it. We'll accomplish it. How much more do you want to do? We'll get it done. It's so great to be surrounded by those kind of people. You say, what do you want to do? We'll go do it. If you can dream it, we can help. If you can dream it, we'll put it together. Unbelievable. How valuable is that? You can't buy it with money. Next, I'm wealthy because of the knowledge that's come my way. The teachers like this weekend who have taught me in those early days, I sat in these classes just like you and took notes and wondered 
about the possibilities. Could it be possible that this stuff is really that simple? But if I put it to work, it could be so profound. Next, I'm wealthy because of my future. A chance to serve, a chance to travel, a chance to teach, a chance to inspire, a chance to tell one more person that the possibilities are limitless no matter what's happened in the past. Next, relationships that are extraordinary. Marriage, friendship, those great, great experiences that have served us all so well. Here's the next. And we've written this somewhere, and some of you may already have it. It says, let others lead small lives, but not you. Let others, you know, cry and whimper over small hurts, but not you. Then another one that really helped me, helped me secure a fortune and fortunes after. Here it is. Learn to help people not just with their jobs, but with their lives. I learned early in my accelerated business career to teach life skills as well as business skills, work skills and job skills. Because guess what? We need both work skills and life skills. Here's the last one. It's a promise from the Bible. Here's what it says. If you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. If you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. They'll make a place for you. You'll be invited to some extraordinary places if you keep working on your gifts. Make yourself valuable, make yourself attractive, make yourself unique. Become a person who has plenty to give and plenty to share, whether it's ideas or money or treasure or time. If you will work on that, you'll have places. Look where my gifts have brought me from the farm country of Idaho to this magnificent place to serve and share ideas, my experiences, hopefully that will make a difference. And last, when I'm gone, people always ask, what would you like said after you're gone? And I came up with something the other day. It was pretty simple, here it is. Jim Rohn made a major contribution to someone. Jim Rohn made a major contribution to someone and then another one, and another one, and another one. Wow. And that journey continues for me. So if you've got my name on your notes, which hopefully I'm sure you have, when we leave here, I go with you, these notes and all the experience that we've had. But I promise you this, as we leave here, I will not leave you behind. I'll take you with me in my thoughts and in my heart. Thank you very much. God bless.